We meet again. So there has been some drama in, of all places, Cosu. For those of you that don't know, Cosu is a name given to the section of YouTube dealing with historical dress and historical costuming. Big names in this scene would be Burnett Banner, Rachel Maxey, Morgan Donner, and many other lovely human beings. And recently, this lovely, wholesome corner of the internet has been infected with racism. And not even the way you're probably thinking, although if you are looking for that drama, take a look at this video from Rachel Maxey about vintage style and vintage values. Or go check out Dandy Wellington, who I believe coined the phrase. Definitely check out his merch store, which has the cutest pins. No, today we're talking about modern racism. Gone are the days of H.P. Lovecraft and his cats. So let's introduce some new characters because I am again ripping off Lindsay Ellis. So Dean, or Christine, at least I think that's her real name. God, I haven't checked. Anyway, Celestine is an Asian American physician who posts her historical costuming project on her YouTube channel and still finds time somewhere to maintain an Etsy shop where she posts the cutest embroidery. Abby Cox, former Vape of American Duchess historical footwear and member of costume as of this year. Quarantine has got to all us as apes. Also good for this video, Abby is white. We're white passing. At founding mother, or Sarah, not a costumer, at least that I can see, but a librarian and historical interpreter, which is basically like professional history cosplay, dream job. We've also had a little chat on Instagram and she's a lovely gal. We also introduced a dress or a certain style of dress, the robe a la française, which is a certain style of 18th century gown. It is this gown that has caused the racism. Over the past little while, Sosteen has posted a few different videos in which she refers to the robot Francais. In those videos, she mispronounced it as Bronchai. Now, I, being a bit of a friend of her myself, recognize that it's pronounced Francais, but I was really just being pretentious. It, it does not matter overall. But then Abby came out with a video in which she also refers to the robe as the robot of Francais. There were also some other French terminology that was also mispronounced. Uh, both of them apologized for their terrible French, by the way. Then, in early December 2020, Sarah posted an Instagram story comparing the comments section under Sosteen's video and those under Abby's video. Specifically, how often comments were correcting or critiquing the two women's pronunciations. For Abby, of 908 comments at the time that Sarah went through, 10 mentioned her French. For Sosteen, out of 348 comments, 30 mentioned her French. Sosteen also chimed in that she had removed six additional comments because they were particularly shitty. So 10 out of 908 is just over 1%, but 36 out of 348 is more than 10%. Again, both women are extremely talented and knowledgeable. Abby has years of experience working in a dress history and historical dress, and Sosteen, in addition to being so stinking talented, I mean, look at this, she drew these stripes on my hand. Uh, she's also a fucking doctor? We do not deserve this queen. So the thing that's causing such a divide between the numbers on Abby's video and Sosteen's video appears to be... the race. Excuse you! How dare you call me a liberal! Anyway, I thought you could use this as a moment for growth and education. So, let's talk about internal biases. Biases? Biases? Biasome? Whatever. So I want to start off by saying most internal biases are unconscious, or they start out that way. To help explain that, I want to bring back our old friend, Gloria Yamada. The forms of racism that I pick up on these days are 1. Aware blatant racism, 2. Aware covert racism, 3. Unaware unintentional racism, and 4. Unaware self-righteous racism. I like this quote because it, to me, highlights that racism can be more than just what Yamato refers to as aware slash blatant. Things like minstrel shows, slavery, segregation, the things that it's easy to identify as racist. What we call internal or implicit biases are biases and prejudices that we hold against people based on their race, sex, age, appearance, or any other similar attribute that we're not initially conscious of. These aren't your died in the world races, but everyone to a certain extent. Even those that in their main consciousness are woke or 
all four things like racial and sexual equality can harbor these tendencies. One of the biggest examples of this, at least for Black people, is their hair. It is generally considered rude or harmful to touch a Black person's natural hair. Or their fake hair. Don't touch people's hair! This is because it's essentially making their hair a commodity or an oddity. It makes them feel like an animal in a petting zoo. Like, we don't often see white people asking other white people if they can touch their hair. But it's something about a Black person's curls that just makes us want to touch, which is fed by this exoticizing or fetish rights into Black people in our culture. It's the reason we see such a popularity of so-called ebony porn in other similar race-based porn categories, as well as the idea of the BBC. There isn't really a white porn category on Pornhub. The closest you get is country-specific, like Russian or Czech, and those are fairly unpopular in comparison. Specifically, white men in porn being white is only called attention to in regards to another act of being a person of color, like the white guy getting cuffed by the black guy, or interracial porn. How did we get onto porn from historical dress? Anyway. The issue of hair is also complicated by the fact that, still, in our Lord of Cesario 2020, so-called ethnic hair is considered unclean or unprofessional. Black women and girls are still getting sent home from school and work for wearing their hair in the way that it naturally grows and curls. This, by the way, is why it's considered a bad look for white people to emulate ethnic hairstyles like braids, cornrows, and those super tight curls. We shouldn't have a society where a white girl can be on the cover of a magazine with the same hairstyle that got a black girl sent home. And this can have more drastic consequences than just touching a black girl's hair or yelling at seamstresses on the line. We also hear from people all the time that doctors will not believe them because they're women or because they're black or because they're fat. I'm not necessarily saying that I'm... I'm not necessarily saying that doctors think all people of color, women, and fat people are actively lying about their symptoms, but that how they approach the issue is impacted by their patients' attributes. For instance, a study in 2012 found that pediatricians were more likely to prescribe painkillers to patients if they were white than if they were black. That's with all other variables controlled by the way. When the doctor arrived, he explained that I was probably just too fat, and that spotting was normal, and he sent me home. Later that night, my ass started hurting, just behind the butt muscle and off a bit to the side. I called the nurse. She asked me if my back hurt. I said no, it was my butt that hurt. The nurse said it was probably constipation. I should try to go to the bathroom. By the end of three days, my butt still hurt, and I had not slept more than 15 minutes straight in almost 70 hours. This is the story of Professor Tracy McMillan Cotton, a black woman who, four months into her pregnancy, started bleeding at work and went to the doctor's office. The good one on the white side of town. And I am sad to say that it gets worse. So if you want to skip that, here's the content. I went to the hospital. They asked again about my back, implied I had eaten something bad for me, and gradually finally decided to do an ultrasound. The image showed three babies, only I was pregnant with one. The other two were tumors, larger than the baby. Eventually, a night nurse mentioned that I had been in labor for three days. You should have said something, she scolded me. After several days of labor pains that no one ever diagnosed because the pain was in my butt and not my back, I could not hold off labor anymore. I was wheeled into a delivery operating room where I slipped in and out of consciousness. At one point I awoke and screamed, motherfucker. The nurse told me to watch my language. I begged for an epidural. The anesthesiologist glared at me and said if I wasn't quiet, he would leave and I would not get any pain relief. Just as a contraction crested, the needle pierced my spine and I tried desperately to be still and quiet so he would not leave me there that way. 30 seconds after the injection, I passed out before my head hit the pillow. When I awoke, I was pushing and then my daughter was here. She died shortly after her first breath. After making plans for how we would handle her remains, the nurse turned to me and said, just so you know, there was nothing we could have done because you did not tell us you were in labor. Like millions of women of color, especially black women, the healthcare machine could not imagine me as competent, and so it neglected and ignored me until I was incompetent. This story is tragic, but it's just one example of a systemic issue with our healthcare. On a similar note, fat people often have issues that go undiagnosed because the doctor just assumes the answer is to lose weight. 
or women will have symptoms misaligned to their period, or take the AIDS pandemic, which, despite, like, no medical basis, was initially referred to as GRIT, the gay-related immunodeficiency, and was thought to only be able to affect the gay community, specifically gay men. This is, spoilers, not true, but it took a while for the medical world to figure that out. Meanwhile, women and straight men who got it through sex and intravenous drug users who got it that way were ignored. That last one also had some ass issues, though. This created the environment for GRID, later known as AIDS, to be seen not just connected to, but caused by gayness, or the gay lifestyle. That, of course, being code for horny birds that just try to fuck any and every man they see, probably while being blitzed on party days with some hoppers. Or that it was a divine curse sent from God above to punish those filthy sinners. And we still see the effects of this today. There are still people who think that AIDS was sent by God to get the gays. Yet all FDA regulated blood drives can't take blood from most gay men because they are thought to be more at risk for disease. Now, even if this were true, it isn't, like, blood drives test all the blood they take in before they send it out. Like, people use it to get tested for STDs. And if they allowed gay men to donate blood, all that would mean was they would have to test and potentially throw out more blood. Now, I did tell a little fan of, you actually can donate blood if you're a gay man. If you're a fucking cuck! I'm only mostly joking. You can't donate blood if you are a man who has had sex with another man within the past three months. Which is down from 12 before the pandemic. They only brought it down though because they were running out of blood. Well, at least they're trans positive. In addition, there's also the new stigma around HIV positive people. There's also the flip side of internal biases, what's normally called internalized impression. Uh, you ever see a mask for mask guy and writer and you're just like, oh, poor, poor thing. Or uh, pick me ass bitches. If you're not hip to the lingo, a pick me ass bitch is a member of a marginalized group who publicly, loudly, and frequently disavows these stereotypes of that group in a way that's derogatory to the rest of the group, which supposedly does fit those stereotypes, as well as being done to win the favor of the majority group. Like they're yelling, pick me, pick me! The sad thing is, no matter how much DL mask a plants says drag queens are dangerous to children and pride parades are just too much, or how much Becky brags about reading books and not wearing makeup, the straight white men aren't going to give you any more rights than the rest of us degenerates. There's also the whole violently homophobic politicians being found out as frequenting gory holes or being found on Grindr. We also see examples of people of a marginalized group buying into some more harmful ideas about that group, like undocumented immigrants buying the myths about the undocumented even while not fitting them. Or when a guy is so afraid of being a fag, he leans really hard into traditional masculine stereotypes to prove himself as a real man. Now, maybe Tommy really does like trucks and football and having thighs that would make great earmuffs. Maybe he doesn't. But the internalized homophobia turns out hatred is mentally damaging and can cause issues the longer it goes on. But it's not our fault! And no, it's not. People don't get these internal biases by active choice. They rather get instilled by a mixture of our culture and our natural tendency towards in-groups and out-groups. I think Avenue Q was pretty close with the song Everyone's a Little Bit Racist, but where I and Avenue Q disagree is that we shouldn't leave these unchecked. We don't have to stay racist. Just because you naturally are biased towards a certain ethnic group doesn't give you a free pass because it's in your nature. Because if you become aware of a bias and choose to double down on it instead of examining it and working to undo it, then it is your fault. You actively chose to keep that bias. Also, I think mean, you kind of downplays how bad racism can be. Like, the biggest thing we get is Christmas Eve being anti-Semitic. Like, maybe everyone is a little racist, but some people are a bit racist. Sarah brought this up too in her racist stories. She writes, if you're consuming costuming content on YouTube and find yourself reacting differently to historical costumers of color than to white historical costumers, say, for example, jumping to correct the costumer of color's pronunciation while letting the white costumer's pronunciation slide, examine that. Take a few seconds before you comment to think about why that's your initial response. 
If you want, there are some tests that you can take that will point out how you might be acting on internal and implicit biases, and then you can work to undo them. I'll put those links in the video. Or just be open to criticism when someone calls you out on something. Even if you didn't mean any malice behind it, doesn't mean it's not harmful. It's hard emotional work, but if you care about any person who exists in the margins, it's what you should do.